Good morning. I must do like my bishop says. When he raises his hand, we, we keep quiet. <laughs> Good morning to you all. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ in the working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, let us pray. God of love who brought us to birth and in whose arms we die, in our grief and shock, contain and comfort us. Give us hope in our confusion and embrace us with your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Friends, this is going to be um, partly a Masonic service, so there will be parts that is Masonic, and, um, and part will also be myself just bringing a word of comfort to the family. We will be singing the hymns, the music will come over the um, speakers, the hymns are there. We'll start with Amazing Grace just now and then we'll end with Abide With Me. And um, so let us start. Christopher John Sanderson. Christopher John Sanderson. Christopher John Sanderson. My brethren, the role of a workman has been called, and one master mason has not answered his name. He's laid down the working tools of the craft, and with them he has left that mortal part for which he no longer has use. His labours here below have taught him to divest his heart and conscience of the vices and accompaniments of life, thereby fitting his, 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 his mind as a living stone that, for that spiritual building, that house, not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Strengthened in his labour here by faith in God and confident of expectation of immortality, he has sought admission to the celestial lodge above. <coughs> Dear friends, we gathered here this morning to share and celebrate the life of Christopher John Sanderson, known to many of us as Chris, born on the 23rd of March of 1946 and sadly passed away on the 14th of March 2024 at the age of 77 years, 11 months, nearly 78 years. Chris was initiated in Fraternity Lodge number 7729 on the role of the Grand Lodge of the United Grand Lodge of England on the 19th of February 1979. He resigned on the 20, on, in 2016 and joined Golden Harvest Lodge number 9234 in the English Constitution where he's a member until his passing. Chris received his first craft district grants as past district uh, Assistant Grand Director of Ceremonies in 1990. In 1995, he was promoted to past District Senior Grand Deacon, in 2000 to past District Junior Grand Warden, and in 2008, a past District Senior Grand Warden. And you'll notice his apron there on the table, and that is the highest rank that he attained, the Senior Past District Senior Grand Warden. Chris has survived, and our sincerest condolences to his wife, Nan, his sons, Campbell, who is with us, and Andrew, who is in Australia, um, but following on the live stream. We trust that the Lord will be with you in this day and also bring you comfort. And also, Andrew is very far away at the moment. On behalf of Chris's family, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time this morning to come and stand with them in their hour of need. Um, I have a hospice that I've ministered to in Alberton, Stepping Stone Hospice. And often I go there and I, I don't read scripture, I don't pray, I just sit with the family. The ministry of presence, just being there. And you being here today, I can guarantee you, means a lot to the family. Thank you. 
Thank you for coming. Today is a difficult day. Fifteen years ago on this day, my, my mother died. And uh, so it's not easy to be doing a service here today either for me. So every time I do a service like this, I read from Romans chapter 8, verse 35 to 39, where Paul says, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ, which is in Christ, love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing in all of creation, not even death, can separate Chris from the love of his God. Let us pray. <clears throat> Great architect of the universe, our Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we humbly ask thy blessing on this assembly and thy divine guidance on the duties before us. May this service pay loving and adequate tribute to the memory of our brother, Chris, be a comfort to his family and friends, and with the deepest reverence to thee. Amen. So friends, we're going to sing uh, the first hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. And I invite you to be upstanding as we sing. Thank you. Be seated. Dear family and friends, we gather here this morning to do three things. First is the time for us to take a look at our own lives. We're all going to pass away someday. It's a great time to ask those tough questions. Am I ready to die? Where will my life be when I breathe my last breath? But second, maybe more important, is we're going to celebrate the life of Chris. We're sad, 
But we all remember Chris. We remember his uniqueness. And um, there will be some tributes paid to Chris. And third, this is the time for us to say goodbye to Chris. And as hard as the service is, I trust that a few words that I'm going to try and speak will be a comfort, especially for you, the family. We praise God that his life of no pain, no concern, no lack of understanding has begun in his heavenly home with his Lord and Saviour. So we're going to remember, we're going to say goodbye, and we're going to reflect upon our own lives. So at this point of time, I'm going to ask Campbell to come forward, and he's going to do the first tributes. G'day, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, very tough day, so um, I'm going to do a lot of reading. Christopher, Chris, CJS, Jinx, Dad, Granddad, and your most important one, Dad. It is impossible to sum up your amazing life and the special person you were in the space of a few short paragraphs. Born in Derbyshire, England, into a military family and the son of Lieutenant Colonel Gustav Scott and Joyce Sanderson, your formative years were spent growing up in exotic places such as Greece, Malaya, Germany, and Sierra Leone. Despite his parents living abroad, his family roots were well and truly proudly in Scotland. And Dad and his brother Julian, who's here with us today, spent their entire school career in Lotto outside Edinburgh. And it's very difficult. I see some young people with young kids here today, and I have some young kids. Uh, it's difficult to imagine in 2024, uh, but from primary school days, uh, there was a significant amount of travel involved, uh, often unaccompanied by adults, which is pretty amazing. Uh, this in conjunction uh, with his old Lauritonian friends uh, and stays with Kathy and Jim Whelan, is where I believe Dad honed his tremendous sense of humour, wit, passion for fishing, ability to negotiate his way out of most situations, absolute love for laughing and building lifelong uh, mateships. Dad, a bit like me, had delusions of one day playing first grade provincial or representative rugby. This, along with an ill-conceived idea to ultimately and unsuccessfully work as a miner, uh, was one of the reasons he actually immigrated to South Africa in 1967. So we're really glad that did, fell through. Um, while rugby never uh, uh, worked out for either of us, uh, sorry, um, chiefly as we both liked the party afterwards much more than we actually enjoyed playing the game, um, almost um, it remained one of his greatest passions. Um, some of most, my most endearing uh, memories of my dad was scrumming practice with him in our kitchen in Parkhurst, which is about the size of this little section here, if you haven't been there, uh, where he had great joy thrashing me around the room trying to show me the dark arts of being a front row forward. Um, trips to Ellis Park, listening to the, 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 the then unknown quantum of Kevin Bloody Wilson, Brian Wiley, you know those, and the steadfast, uh, steadfast support of my rugby, rugby teams, and tours through the years. I'm sure that many uh, of you also share, likewise, very fond memories of Dad's passion for sport, the clubs that he played in, and uh, all the memories around those. As the old saying goes, rugby is the game they play in heaven, and I'm convinced that Dad and late great Bill McLaren, the voice of rugby, are comparing notes and sipping on a few whiskies celebrating Scotland's recent win over the Poms. Um, I shall miss our rugby chats, Dad. Um, um, your keen interest and in knowledge of the game, players, and at times reps. Um, now as a young father, I appreciate how much Dad did for, uh, to provide for his family and strike the difficult balance between working and playing hard. While at times weeks were spent abroad in a role in an industry that he was extremely passionate about, he was a devout father and husband. Time was always made to catch up with friends and socialise over weekends, the days before internet, streaming and mobile services. I have learned it takes a village to raise a child. And we were blessed to grow up with the Wileys, Van Harveys, Moyers, Jones, Brittons, Kirby's, Glynns, um, Elliot's, uh, sorry, Dee, Kerry, and Taryn, and so many more wonderful people in this room who were such a large part of Dad and our lives. Um, my dad generally loved, I can say that he loved each and every one of you, and uh, nothing gave, gave him more joy over the years than seeing all your family succeed and grow. It, it meant so much to him. 
Uh, there has been an outpouring of letters and support uh, and sharing of some really great memories of my dad over the last few weeks. Um, while I can't read them all, um, they are very special and have made a, a world of difference to mum, Andrew and I. Mum, thanks for looking after dad through the most difficult, his most difficult time of need. Thanks. Thanks, Edie. Um, while extremely tough, your presence and steadfast uh, support would have been an unfathomable comfort and constant for him, and we knew he was loved by you and his family. <laughs> Thanks to everyone who's been there for mum, uh, many of you in the room today, uh, in the last two months. Um, I, I can't tell you how much it's uh, meant, and to everyone who's here in person and online. Andrew and I can't thank you enough. Um, Dad, through my life, you always kept your head when others all about you were losing theirs. <laughs> Thank you for all the love, all you've done and for what you've taught me, not least your wisdom and lessons in integrity, work, work ethic, kindness, honesty, and friendship. Lisa, Kayla, our little Tristan, and I love you with all our hearts. We'll meet again. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dee, and I'm reading a few words from Andrew in Australia. So he says, morning everybody. We are here today in the midst of profound sorrow, but also in heartfelt gratitude and love for a man whose presence in our lives was such a blessing. I want to convey my thanks to everyone for attending from all corners of the world, as well as all the love and support that you have and continue to give mom. It's not easy to say goodbye, especially to a man like Dad, as he was a constant in so many of our lives, and given, Dad, given that Dad lived such a full life. I also know a lot of you will be feeling as heartbroken as I am right now, and I also know that if there was anything Dad would have wanted me to say today, it's this. Thank you to all of you for being a part of my life. Everyone sitting here today meant so much to him, his work colleagues, his friends, and most importantly, his whole family. There is an old African proverb which maintains that when an elder dies, a library burns to the ground. This is so reflective of dad. The books of dad's life never sat on shelves. He opened them, read every page, and his life was like a story of history, knowledge, and wisdom. It's times like these that we have to appreciate how much value Dad brought, brought to all our lives and the memories we all have with him and of him. Dad certainly was no saint. He was human, he loved his whiskey, his fags, and rugby, and in no particular order, mind you. That said, he was also an absolute bear of a man who had no patience and an equally short temper when we were growing up. Campbell and I, were like the kids in Jurassic Park. We knew when we were in trouble just by the look he gave us. Maybe if we didn't move, he wouldn't see us. That didn't work, which normally resulted in a warm bum for both of us, regardless of who was at fault. As we got older, this was tempered with great enthusiasm as Campbell and I started playing rugby, which was a great excuse for Dad and us to go to Ellis Park as often as was allowed. This resulted in a hearty prego roll at the Radium Beer Hall, then shoved into a, combi, into a combi listening to Kevin Bloody Wilson while traveling to the game and back. When we started going out with girls, he would comment while sniffing the air, what smells of horse liniment? Which was the aftershave that we applied, which in most cases was dad's old spice. He would then retort, do you want some brill cream as well? Ending with his laugh that came from his belly. I remember traveling up to the farm every few months, and the minute the Ford Sapphire's undercarriage started scraping on the dirt roads, Dad turfed us out, and in some cases, even Mom, claiming there wasn't even weight distribution in the car, and he was worried about damaging the radiator. This resulted in a fair hike up to the farmhouse where Dad was waiting with a beer in hand, still expecting us to unpack the car. Dad only ever changed one nappy when we were babies, and he vehemently stated he would never do it again after the scotch tape and clothes pegs only lasted a few minutes. The trade-off was that he would do the cooking, not realizing that he would still be doing it 43 years later. This was the time when we would speak to Dad while he was cooking dinner, as he termed it, slaving away in the galley kitchen. He would regale us with stories of his youth, initially in Malaysia when he was in primary school, 
to his time at Loretto with cold baths in the middle of the Scottish winters. This progressed as he spoke of his time in the borders having to scrum against Mighty Mouse and Sandy Carmichael for West Scotland. It would seem that he was equally proud of his time at Glasgow University doing a BSc engineering one year failed, as he would refer to it. My dad's failing resulted in granddad telling him that he should explore his options elsewhere as there was no second chances. The bright idea came to him that he would become a miner in South Africa to pursue his wealth and riches abroad, resulting in dad heading here in 1966. He would then describe his days in the communal houses he shared with the likes of Brian, Tony, Paul, Mike, and many others. <laughs> These stories would beg belief with turkeys over Christmas and eggs thrown on the walls if there was a movie they didn't like. All these stories ended again with a belly laugh that would light up a room. Dad, however, had a quiet presence on how he carried himself. He never forced Campbell and I into anything in life. To the contrary, he always saw any situation with complete clarity and provided surety and calmness in his words as we were growing up. His words were few but always measured. Dad being dad taught Campbell and I through the example he set. Dad was rich in wisdom, in kindness and love. He knew the value of hard work and resilience, the importance of honesty, the power of kindness and the strength of humility. He taught us to be brave in the face of adversity and to be compassionate in the face of cruelty. Dad was more than a father figure to us to just us. His love, generosity, and character extend, extended past just our nuclear family. Dad embraced Jan as his own daughter when we met 16 years ago. He shared in our trials and tribulations of starting our own family and was fiercely protective of Jan, sometimes to the detriment of me and mom. He always provided guidance, calmness, and love to Jan, either with his actions or a guiding voice. His greatest joy was just sitting on the couch on a Sunday speaking to Megan and Ian. Mom did the lion's share of the talking, while Dad looked on in wonderment and laughing at the exploits of his grandkids, either in sports or academics, or how they are growing up and possibly sharing a few traits of Dad, in particular his humour. D, Taryn and kerri you have been and are a breath of fresh air for Dad. You have and continue to be a constant in our lives. D, Dad loved your bohemian take on life, your sense of humor in all of life's challenges. And as you are doing now, you seem to have this magical ability to support our family and mom seemingly out of thin air. Taryn, Dad loved your grit and fortitude and how you tackle life, the strength you show and how positive you are, always laughing and loving life with grace and humor. Kerri Ann, Dad loved your rugby chats and how you tackle life. The strength you show and how, um, sorry, Dad loved your rugby chats, often referring to players you brought up as blouse pullers when you were talking in the galley kitchen. Your sharp wit always kept Dad on his toes. Mom, it's been 50 years with Dad, some of them not always easy. You have tackled it together with love, courage, and honesty. Chris was your partner, your confidant, and best friend. Remember today that you are also celebrating the love you continue to share, the love you have built and the memories you have created together. The last few months are testament to the unconditional love you have for each other. His passing leaves a profound void for you and us, but know his spirit continues to surround and guide you, and knowing that Dad is now at peace. Dad lived his life embracing every moment, cherishing every day, his legacy is the family and friends he leaves behind, the lives he touched, the hope he brought to us all, and the kindness and compassion he lived by. Today, as we bid farewell to Dad, we are not saying goodbye. Instead, we are saying thank you. Thank you for your unwavering love, for your laughter that continues to echo in our hearts, your wisdom and your guidance. You will always be loved, always be missed, and forever be remembered. Dad, may the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rain fall softly upon your fields until we meet again. And may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. Rest in peace and love, Dad and Chris. With love for Andrew and Jan.
thank you to um, Campbell and Andrew through D sharing the life of Chris. Can I ask you all to stand for a moment of silence in solidarity with the family. Gracious God, we praise you for creating us in your own image, calling each one of us to love and serve you. We thank you for Chris and for all we treasure and remember with gratitude about him. As memories fill our minds, assure us of your forgiveness for things said or done which we regret, for things we long to do but never did. Long to say, but never said. Give us the strength and courage to leave Chris in your keeping, trusting in your everlasting goodness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Dear friends and family, we meet in the solemn moment to worship God, to give thanks for the life of our brother Chris, to commend him into God's loving and faithful care, and to pray for those who mourn. In the presence of death, Christ offers us a sure ground for comfort and hope, and yes, even for joy, because our Lord Jesus Christ, who lived our life and died our death upon a cross on Calvary, was raised again triumphant, and lives forevermore. In him, his people, those who believe in him, find eternal life. Let us then hear the words of Holy Scripture, that from them we may draw comfort and strength. So we're going to be reading two passages of Scripture. One, Ecclesiastes 12, which I'll do a bit later. And using the minister's license, I've chosen another pa passage as well as a passage of comfort for us. I'll read to you from Psalm 91. Hear the word of the Lord. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. There ends the reading. <clears throat> so Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be well pleasing in your sight. Amen. <clears throat> Dear friends, we're going through some dark times in the world. 
False prophets abound in our churches. There's war in the Ukraine and Israel and other parts of the world. And every time we open our newspapers, we read of alleged corruption amongst our leaders. We've just come through a few, two, three years ago, a worldwide pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, which claimed the lives of thousands of people. Fuel prices are rising and unemployment is up, causing great tension, our, tension in our communities and in our families, and many of us struggle to make ends meet. And on the 14th of March of this year, you lost one of your friends, a Masonic brother. You lost a husband. You lost a father. You lost a friend. Chris, to death. How do we keep on going when the world is in such turmoil? How do we keep on going when death has come to our doorstep? Where is the good news of the gospel today when life is so messy and uncertain? And it's in times like these that I'm grateful for the messiness of the Psalms. They admit that life isn't perfect. There are even pandemics, pestilence, COVID-19. They show us pictures of grief and anger, frustration and exhaustion. They give us words to pray when we don't know what to say. They also show us hope. Psalm 91 is one such psalm. Throughout the history of the church, people have turned to this psalm in times of trouble. For what do we need in times of trouble? Dear friends, we need God. We need no one else. Only he can bring us peace. God and God alone can begin to restore our wounded hearts. God and God alone can handle the depth of our anguish. I read the story about Reverend Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse. His wife had died from cancer when she was in her 30s, leaving three children under the age of 12. Barnhouse chose to preach the funeral himself. What does a father say to his motherless children in a time like that? On his way to the service, he was driving with his little family. When a large truck passed them on the highway, casting a shadow over their car. And Bonas turned to his oldest daughter, who was staring disconsolately out of the window and asked, Tell me, sweetheart. Would you rather be run over by that truck or by its shadow? The little girl looked curiously at her father and said, By the shadow, I guess. It can't hurt you. Dr. Barner said quietly to the three children, Your mother has not been overrun by death, but by the shadow of death. There's nothing to fear. And I want to say to you, dear family, and friends of Chris, that he has not been overrun by death, but by the shadow of death. There is nothing to fear. I find this, this poem, the first time I've seen this one, on the back of your, your notices. I'm going to read it to you, because that expresses exactly what I'm trying to get over to you. Don't mourn too much when I'm gone. I have found a new place where I can be free. A whole new beginning just made for me. I know only peace and I never feel pain. Days full of sunshine and not too much rain. I'm no longer old. I've recovered my youth. And all of my dreams are now my truth. I can smile. I can laugh. I can walk, I can run, I can hear every whisper, I can see past the sun. 
My body is whole. My mind is clear. I know all the answers and I'm quite free of fear. I know why you mourn me. I see why you weep. Your heart's full of aching from love that was deep. I'm grateful for loved ones that hold me so dear. But remember that I've found a better place here. I will be beside you, always nearby. Don't mourn me too long and try not to cry. Whenever your sorrow bears down on your heart, think not of my ending, but of my start. Death is not the end of the sentence. It is only a comma. Yes, friends, for a just and virtuous man like Chris, death holds no terrors. Our enemy, the evil one, wants to fill our hearts with fear. He certainly tried to scare the psalm writer before us here in Psalm 91. We're not sure of the exact situation facing the psalmist. It might have been a battle. Maybe he was being pursued by his enemies, the way hound dogs chase a fox or a rabbit. Maybe it was disease or, or death. Maybe it was hunger and Suffering, maybe pain. But whatever it was, the psalmist was fighting fear. The evil one loves it when God's children are scared. He wants to scare us away from God. Away from our faith in Christ. Away from being part of the church. He tries to scare us with death, pain, Suffering, cancer, stroke, COVID-19, heart attack. He tries to scare us with divorce and separation and family fights. He tries to scare us with sin and evil and wickedness. But no matter how hard the devil tries, dear friends, he cannot succeed in driving God's children away. From the Lord. In verse 1 and 2, the psalmist explains why the evil one cannot succeed. He says, He who lives in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. The psalm is known as a Psalm of protection. Stories abound of people who have prayed the psalm during times of hardship and persecution. Finding comfort in its words and the knowledge that our God is a God of providence. Who holds the world in his hands. And in verse 13, or in the first three verse, 13 verses, sorry. In the first three verses of Psalm 91, it is the psalmist who does all the speaking. But from verse 14 to 16, it is the Almighty God who does the speaking. He speaks six times and he says, I will. I will rescue him. I will protect him. I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. I will satisfy him. What a list of promises. But those promises are not just for everyone and anyone. No, not at all. They were never meant to be. Look at verse 14. Because he loved me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I'll protect him, for he acknowledges my name. Do you catch what the Lord is saying? He says that those who love him, those who know him, like we know Chris did, can claim this list of promises for himself, for themselves. Psalm 91's message does not end when we die. It is a psalm that speaks of our life here on earth, 
but also God's continuing care for us at the end of life and into life everlasting as we saw in this beautiful poem on the back of the notices here. The psalm ends with the words of life everlasting. Says the Lord, those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I'll satisfy them and show them my salvation. So in conclusion, my dear friends, we have assembled in the presence of the great mystery, the most pro profound mystery of all human achievements, that change which sooner or later must come to each of us. Yet we have assurance from the Master that when we go upon that journey, we will be in the hands of a true and trusting God, a friend in whose fidelity we may safely confide. And those of us who trust in the Lord, who trust in Him, up to the moment of our death and beyond, for Christ has conquered death and lives and reigns in heaven for us. There he has prepared a place for us as we read in John chapter 14 where Jesus says, Do not be afraid. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I've gone to prepare a place for you. And I'll come again to take you, take you, Chris, to be where I am. We serve a God of faithfulness. He watches over us day by day. We can trust in his protection, his provision, his care, and his love. Knowing that today and tomorrow, the day of our death and on beyond, we can say he, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. To those of you who are not members of the Freemasons fraternity, I wish to explain that from time immemorial, it has been the custom of the fraternity of ancient free and accepted Masons, at the request of a brother or a close relative, to perform the last rites over his remains. In conformity with that usage, we have assembled in the character of Masons to offer our last tribute of affection for our departed brother, Chris Sanderson, thereby demonstrating our esteem for him and our steady attachment to the principles of fraternity. Masonry is the philosophy of life, a distinct system of moral instruction veiled in allegory and illustrated by signs and symbols. One of those symbols is the lamb skin or white leather apron. The white leather apron is an emblem of innocence and the badge of a mason. It reminds us of that purity of life and that, sorry, it reminds us that we have that immortal part within us which will survive the chilling blast of death and springing into new, oh, I missed my place there. Start again. The white leather apron, emblem of innocence and the badge of a mason. It reminds us of that purity of life, of conduct, so essentially necessary for gaining admission to the celestial lodge above, where the great architect of the universe lives and reigns forever.
the evergreen sprig of acacia is the emblem of our faith in the immortality of the soul. By this we are reminded that we have an immortal part within us which shall survive the chilling blast of death and springing into newness of life in the realms beyond the grave shall never, never die. Masons to be upstanding and come forward and place a sprig of acacia on the remains of our brother. The Lord has given, the Lord will take away as we bow to the inevitability of death. Our thoughts turn to the scriptures where we find in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12 the following well-known passage, a passage that Chris probably knew of off by heart like many of us Masons do. Remember now your creation in the days of your youth when difficult Difficult days come, and in your years draw nigh where you say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun and the light, and the moon and the stars are not darkened, and the clouds do not return after the sun. In the day when the keepers of the houses tremble, and the strong men bow down, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look through the windows grow dim. When the doors are shut in the streets, and the sound of grinding is low, when one rises up with the sound of the bird, and the daughters of music are brought low. Also they are afraid of height, and of terrors in the way. When the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden, and desires fail. For man goes to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets. Remember your creature when the silver cord is lost, loosed, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel, wheel broken at the well. Then the dust shall return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God. Who gave it. We shall miss our brother. He's been a good comrade and his hand was ever ready, his heart was ever true. Now he's led where we may follow until we too shall receive the summons. With a firm faith in the Almighty God, creator of the universe, we know that we shall meet again in the realms beyond the skies. So until then, dear friend and brother Chris, 
Until then, farewell. Let us pray. Praise and honor, glory and thanks be given to your almighty God, our Heavenly Father. Because in your great love for the world, you gave your Son, Jesus the Christ, to be our Savior, to bear our grief, to die our death upon a cross on Calvary. We praise you because you brought him back from death with great power and glory and gave him all authority in heaven and earth. We thank you because he has conquered sin and death for us and opened the kingdom of heaven for all believers. We thank you that for Chris, the tribulations of this world is over and death is past. And we pray that you'll bring us with Chris to the joy of your perfect kingdom. Eternal and everlasting Father, you are the author of life and you watch over all things from the greatest to the least. You are our hope in times of trial and our peace in times of distress. We come to you and ask that you grant us the comfort that comes from you. Draw those who remain in this life to one another and help us to know your peace and joy. We lift up Chris's family to you today and ask that your peace, mercy and strength might rest upon them during this time and in the days to come. For your full, perfect and sufficient gift of life in Christ, all praise and thanks be given forever and ever. Amen. We're going to end the service by singing the hymn Abide With Me. I ask you to remain standing after the hymn for the end prayers. And then if you'll then allow the family to retire first. Be up standing as we sing Abide With Me.
us commend Chris to God. God of mercy, as Chris Sanderson has journeyed beyond our sight, we commend him to you. In your keeping, O merciful God, we commend your servant, Chris. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the joy of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light, through Christ Jesus our Lord, who taught us to pray as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Since the earthly life of Christopher Sanderson has come to an end, we commit, commit his body to the elements, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in the certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Blessed are they who die in the Lord, even so says the Spirit. They rest from their labors. <clears throat> Chris, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now, friends, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the love of God the Father and of His Son, Jesus the Christ. May the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. The family will retire first. <clears throat>